Computer graphics have come a long, long way. What's possibly the earliest video game ever, Space War, rendered from wobbles on an oscilloscope, to visuals so rich you can make out every strand of hair, every crack on a plastered wall. While we're still some ways away from real-time photorealism, real-time graphics these days are nothing short of remarkable. That goes double for the GPUs of today, massive, power-hungry beasts that'll take large bites out of your power bill. Sure, the gameplay versus graphics debate isn't going to let up anytime soon, but at the end of the day, games are audiovisual experiences. Visuals are what allow you to interface with the game systems. While a systems-driven game like Total War Attila might require strategy and planning, try playing it with the monitor turned off. Heck, try using your computer sans monitor. It goes without saying that the GPU is a critical part of any system. Exactly how do graphics cards work? What is a graphics card, really? What goes on beneath that ridiculously angular fan shroud? Let's find out. When it comes down to it, the differences between a graphics card and a plain old processor come down to a matter of implementation of what your priorities are. A CPU is a general purpose processor, reasonably good for handling just about any kind of workload, whether you're talking audio, visuals, or Excel macros. A graphics card, on the other hand, is a specialized piece of hardware that's really good at one thing, processing and outputting visuals. When it comes to traditional polygon-based 3D graphics, the need of the hour is for something that can handle a very large volume of largely similar problems at the same time. A 3D mesh is made up of thousands of flat 2D polygons stitched together. In order for a model to animate, you need to solve just as many geometry operations, shearing, rotating, and transform, all in real time. A CPU wouldn't be the best choice here. CPUs tend to have a limited number of high-performance cores, typically between 2 to 8, each of which can only handle a limited number of instructions in real time, not factoring in time slicing. Relative to a GPU core, each CPU core is substantially stronger, but again, better suited to complex linear tasks. GPU architectures then are set apart because of their focus on parallelism. Originally, graphics rendering was done in software by the CPU. With the relatively simple sprite-based games in existence up until the 90s, there wasn't much need for dedicated graphics hardware. As video game graphics increased in complexity around the mid-90s, with the advent of polygonal 3D games like Quake, there was a sudden need for dedicated, highly parallel graphics hardware to accelerate graphics rendering. Because high-end 3D graphics rendering isn't a typical use case for all PC owners, dedicated graphics cards are add-in components that slot into the motherboard's PCI Express slot. Because of the rich visual interfaces that even ordinary applications these days have, think Windows Arrow or drop-down reflections in PowerPoint, most modern processors have an integrated on-die graphics component to ensure that everyday graphics workloads are handled without a hitch. Although integrated graphics have steadily improved over the years, you really need a dedicated graphics card to handle today's games at reasonable resolutions and frame rates. As we mentioned earlier, dedicated cards slot into your motherboard's PCIe interface. This very fast bus is what the CPU uses to talk to the GPU. A GPU can't operate all on its lonesome. Your operating system and application don't directly interface with the GPU. Rather, via an API such as DirectX or OpenGL, they tell the CPU to issue draw calls to the GPU, which tell it what it's supposed to draw on screen, and is then outputted over your HDMI DVI cable to your monitor. But back to the PCIe interface. The faster your CPU and GPU can communicate, the less of a performance hit you're going to incur, so naturally they'll need a very high-speed interface. A PCIe slot can offer up to 16 lanes for communication, each of which can handle 8 giga transfers per second, or GT per S as of the PCIe 3.0 standard. A high-speed PCIe interface can eliminate the communications bottleneck between a processor and a GPU. At least in the desktop space, this is something we take for granted, but you only have to look at performance figures for external GPUs, eGPUs, to see just how important it is to have a high-speed interface between the CPU and GPU. Bandwidth-starved eGPU configurations only offer up a fraction of the GPU's performance over PCIe, unless we're dealing with a newer Thunderbolt 3 setup. What exactly is your CPU communicating with? What makes up a GPU? Although you might have a tough time getting your graphics card in your chassis, especially if a triple slaughter, graphics cards are 90%, well, hot air. The massive angular bulging bits comprise the fans, the shroud, and the heat pipes. The actual GPU chip is a bit smaller than a cookie. Even a mammoth GPU like GM200 is barely 6 centimeters square. Everything else is part of an elaborate attempt to prevent that 6 centimeter square cookie from going supernova. While a GPU may be small, it can generate a lot of heat while operating. The heat sink is made up of copper, which is a great conductor of heat because, you know, you want to conduct heat away from the GPU. The fan or fans then blow away the heated air nearby. The GPU chip is a marvel all by itself. A modern GPU like GP104 consists of over 7 billion transistors, each of them a microscopic 14 nanometers. This is surrounded by the VRAM modules. GDDR5 module capacity has increased over the years, meaning we can have more video memory without having to dedicate more space for it. We're now at a point where mainstream cards offer 4 GB of VRAM as standard. 
the memory interfaces with the GPU via a number of memory controllers, the more the merrier. Bandwidth to the video memory depends on both the memory clock and the bus width. The GPU itself comprises of arrays of thousands of specialized cores, laid out in a particular way. Shader cores are numerous in number and handle shading. These include geometry, vertex, and pixel shading. Back in the day, different shader cores were employed for different shading functions, vertex shaders and pixel shaders. Vertex shaders would construct 3D models out of vertices or points and vectors or lines, and pixel shaders handle color and depth at the per pixel level. A non-unified shader design with a separate vertex and pixel shaders is inefficient and inflexible. Dynamic workloads mean that at any given time, you'll have different vertex and pixel shading workloads making it difficult to keep all stages equally occupied at all times. This led to the development of unified shader architectures in which each shader core could handle all shading functions. Apart from shader cores, texture mapping units, TMUs, are another key component. The job of the TMU is fairly self-evident. They scale, transform, and map 2D texture bitmaps onto models. The number of TMUs correlates directly with the texture fill rate, which is the rate at which textured pixels can be rendered. ROPs or render outputs are the final piece of the puzzle. Once pixels are both shaded and textured, the ROPs determine the final specific pixel values through rasterization. Antialyzing may be applied at this point. The ROPs then write this output to the frame buffer, the fill rate measuring the rate at which this can be done. The rate at which everything gets done is determined by the clock speed. Clock speed is measured in hertz and is determined by the frequency, cycles per second, of a crystal oscillator on the motherboard. This rate is used as a kind of mathematical reference point from which the different speeds at which different components, your CPU, your RAM, and of course your GPU, are derived. Unfortunately, because of thermodynamics, the faster work gets done, the more heat is produced. When it comes to increasing performance, you can either increase the clock speed or increase the number of shaders, TMUs, and ROPs. This is where overclocking comes in. Unless you've got an electron microscope and industrial robots handy, you can't exactly make any changes to the underlying GPU architecture. However, you can alter the clock speed and voltages, with greater heat output being the main trade-off. Voltages and clock speed have an interesting relationship. When we talk about the speed of the GPU at a very fundamental level, we're talking about the speed at which transistors switch between on and off states. Transistors work by turning on when an input signal is at or above a minimum voltage, and by turning off when it's not. Let's take P as the voltage required to turn a transistor on, and I as your regular input voltage. In this case, the difference, P minus I, is the amount by which the voltage would have to be increased to turn that transistor on. While this is incredibly fast from our time frame, it's not an instantaneous changeover. There's a certain amount of lag time to get up to the threshold voltage and to come down. The clock speed, on the other hand, determines the rate at which the signal is switched on and off. Think of it this way, the voltage differential is two sides of a court that your uh, voltage guy has to run between, and the clock speed determines how many times he has to run back and forth. The clock speed is set too high, the transistor itself may not be able to turn on off fast enough, it'd be like if the voltage guy was told to switch directions while in the middle of the court. Some of the inputs would simply not register, and you'd have instability. What's the solution here? You could reduce the lag time by increasing the baseline voltage. This reduces the differential. You could run between sides if the court's narrower. The trade-off with increasing the voltage is that this causes heat output to increase exponentially, which is why extreme overclockers benchmark with liquid nitrogen, because otherwise they'd probably set their desks on fire. As with most things in life, overclocking is all about trying to find a balance between tolerances, voltages, clock speeds, heat output, and your patience and or sanity. The GPU is an essential part of any system, and with the rise of GPGPU, the not-so-humble graphics processor is going to be lavished with even more attention in the years to come. A modern GPU is among the pinnacles of our technological progress, and that's pretty awesome even if it eats into your power bill. What's your take on the whole situation? Like this video? Why not give us a like and subscribe? We try and upload amazing videos almost every single day. Thank you for watching this video and we'll see you on the next one.